He alau au mal mal mau hele ka naka iluna wa ka yo ka ho ka ula ka ho akale na wi ho e ka pu ava pu ava uli pu ava ke a moa ka ni moa hi ni mahi ki na ka lele kalani o wa o ke li uli we ke ka o ke ka no ye mai tai ti tu a tai ti mo mai tai tai ta pata bo a ka ni e ye mai ka pole ko wa ke aku a na na ye o idea tu a e ula no e e to ho po ta ni e ta ma uli ola Eola hoi o mauli ola, eola ia oe tāne tu me lona, oia ho oia eola. U ke kāne hua vai a kua kena o kālina ka wai o uluai. O ka huli o ka uo o ho nua pai a i ke au au ka mana wa e au lo lo te pō. O piha, o piha, piha, o piha u, o piha, piha e. Teto oho nua pa ai kalani u leva te au ya kumuli po kapo po no aloha kabelina ania uku apau wau neo kalekoa kaeo he keki noho ino ka moko puni o Maui aloha mai ka poi o Maui Nui ko umahalo ya kapulani me kahele ko ulua kono ana yau hele mai kia kia ahiyahi no lela hevahi olelo kia no kia mea o kia loha aina o ya io no lela mahalo ya uku apau ano holi kia ana ko holohi ana i kia vahi leo no lela aloha. I'd like to again first just thank, uh, very much thank, I appreciate uh, Kapulani back there and Kahele uh, inviting me to come and uh, share. Um, and I think uh, the last time we were here was back in like 2016 maybe, I'm not really sure, 15. Um, that was over the last Mauna Kea uh, struggle. That we, we were here also. And um, I, first I'd like to say I apologize. I've been kind of sick for the last couple of days. And so um, the brain isn't working too well. Um, so if I, if I get stuck or I kind of stutter, yeah, again, a kalamai. Um, just going to kind of freestyle some different things, uh, different things I've been talking about recently, um, especially up in the Mauna. Some of the lectures and talks I've been doing up there uh, entitled, uh, one of the subjects I talk about is Aloha Aina Oye Io. And I kind of just want to start about talking a little bit about that concept or those concepts, especially in regards to how it relates to everything that's going on today in this world and this time. So <coughs> Wait, make sure I get my coffee. Coffee, keep the brain flowing. But I'd like to thank uh, you know, everyone here at uh, Kapiolani Community College. I myself am a, a professor at the University of Hawaii Maui College. And so I really appreciate um, for the most part, the kind of education that occurs on so-called community colleges as we service the community at large. And for me, that's a very key element. Yeah, the idea of educating the community at large is really the key element really for our people, specifically the Kanaka and for all peoples who, who live in Hawaii to this day. But let's start off with looking at the concept of aloha aina oya i'o. So of course, we start off with the word aloha. And aloha can be broken down into many different so-called English meanings. So what are some of the meanings that we know of aloha? Huh? Akahai. Akahai, good. Yeah, being gentle. So you think of aloha, what else does it mean? Love, love. what kind of love? Romantic love? Unconditional. Unconditional love? Yeah, can be the kind of love that a uh, grandmother has for a grandchild. Yeah, it can have this kind of deep compassion, empathy. Yeah, so aloha has this huge kind of, you know, connections to many, many different concepts that has to kind of be all involved, all encompassing. And so in a very simple way, people use the word love, but in love in itself, you know, that's another very complicating word. And to me, aloha is in fact uh, a lot more deeper than just the kind of English translation of love is that, you know, it has kind of feelings of having, you know, again, empathy and compassion, humanity, um, the willingness to share, 
being unconditional. And then we look at the word Aina. And Aina, yeah, people not like to make a nice simple meaning. Aina means land. Well, even that we start to find very quickly. Even that is way too shallow than the meaning of just land. Because if it's just land in the holy world, then we're talking about private property. We're talking about real estate. So would I say, is Aina equal real estate? Probably not. See, very different. In fact, Aina is a Polynesian word, a Proto-Polynesian word. Yeah, the word Aina comes from the word Kainga. And Kainga, um, you know, for, for Polynesians, it has a very deeper meaning. In fact, Kainga is really the word for family. So you can see, even for the Hawaiian root word of Aina, which is what we call land, or that which feeds you, that which provides you life. Yeah, Aina. Has a deeper meaning which you would call in, you know, anthropology, a familial relationship, that it really what land is to Polynesians, it's really familial, it's family. Well, what is family? Yeah, family is that which nurtures, family is that which cares, takes care of you. Yeah, family is where you come from, you belong to, genetically, besides socially. So we look at the word Aina in Hawaii, we have to kind of think of it, in, you know, not to be simplified in a holy word, which means just land, but really see it for what it really means in a Polynesian sense. And that's why in Hawaiian we all know, yeah, when we meet each other for the first time, generally, especially in traditional times when they would introduce each other, when you meet each other, the favorite words or the most famous words would be said, of course, is nohea mai oi. From whence do you come? From where do you belong? And that, in a fancy word, in an epistemological worldview, who you are is defined in a Hawaiian thinking of where you come from. Now, in a Hawaiian worldview, that makes perfect sense. Because what shapes you is both your genealogy, but also the culture and the social, the particular kind of environment that you may come from will help to shape you and your character. Now, one thing we notice when you think about places like Hawaii, what makes Hawaii special, very special, not that we are considered one of the most, if not the most, remotest place in the world, in the center really of the Pacific, thousands of miles, thousands, from the nearest shores. And so getting here, just getting to these islands for all life forms, all biota, was very difficult. And some people say as much as one in every 100,000 years. And you might have a particular life form get here. And we can look at something like, I don't know, maybe the Nene Goose or something. Suppose it comes from the Canadian Goose. Whatever reason it got here, how it got here, ends up on these islands, able to reproduce, have some eggs, sustain itself. Then after some time, through natural selection, it adapts Physically, it transforms itself from being like a Canadian goose that used to fly to now a Hawaiian goose of these islands that run around. And so the landscape, the landscape shapes the biology. And I would say that much for our people also. Now what makes Hawaii even more special, not just being remote, but when you look at the kind of landscapes that we have in these islands, think about this island, think about this side of the island, and you compare it, you know, you take a car ride halfway, you know, I mean, half a mile, I'm mean, sorry, half an hour down the road, Pro City, another half an hour, maybe now you stay on the Waianae coast, or you can go half an hour up, uphill, and you can quickly see the kind of landscapes, the biospheres that we have here, I really like, unlike any other place in the world, the variety of landscapes in Hawaii, where you can go from a rainforest in Puna, take a half a mile, you know, again, a half day drive, and you stay in the, a desert of lava. Another half an hour drive, and you in a dry land. In other words, 
What makes Hawaii special also is the kind of landscapes that we have here, a variety of landscapes. And so our kupuna, when they came to these lands, now what I'm, I'm trying to compare with that when I meet other so-called native peoples. You know, I meet some native peoples who come from, for example, the prairie areas. And for them, as far as you can see, it's a prairie. So their whole culture is adapted to what? The prairie. Now, when you look at our kupuna, what's very different about our kupuna? Depending on where they came from, what island, what valley, what side of the island, the landscapes were all different. So one of the things about our kupuna is our, our ability to adapt. It's kind of like genetically coded within us. We have this interesting way of adapting to all the different kind of landscapes out there because that's where we came from. And that's not even looking at things like fishing. If you're involved with families who do fishing, you notice, I mean, how somebody might fish in Milo'li'i on Hawaii Island ain't the same how somebody might be fishing off of Puna or people that might be fishing out of Hana or on the Waianae Coast. Their ability to adapt was something that was necessary. The ability to kind of like be able to handle all the different uh, challenges is reflected from the land. And so when I, when I think about our kupuna, I always say this, you know, we come from our people, really, not like any other people out there. We have Mauna Kea, over 13,000, 14,000 feet high. Think about that. To the Kula Coast, maybe 3,000 feet high, where they would grow much of the foods up in the uplands in Kona. To the seashore in Milo'li'i. And our kupuna adapted to all of those landscapes. So when I think about our kupuna and the idea of aina, I always, I always say, you know, we got to really think in a very Hawaiian way. That part of our, what makes us, and I'm going to use the word special perhaps, is that ability, is that kind of recognition of, of this depth and breadth of landscapes that we come from. And I don't think any other people in the world really had to adapt in that kind of manner. And that's why, if, even, even to this day, when you think about kalo farming, if you grow taro, even on Maui, how they might grow taro in Kianai, not going to be the same how they grow taro in Kahakoloa, not going to be the same as guys who grow in Kipahulu, definitely not going to be the same as guys who grow in Waipio, and vice versa. So when you think about taro farming, you quickly see which is the right method, the one that works. The one that adapts certain colors, certain pH levels, certain levels of uh, the, 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 you know, the coolness of the water, all these factors have to be adapted to. So there's from, in other words, we do not have, Hawaiians do not have a monolithic world. We don't have a, such a thing as there's one way to do something. We come from a people who had many different ways of getting to the right answer, depending on the environment, and the conditions that you live on. And to me, that's a very important way to, and I'll come back to this later on, to think about. So again, aloha aina. What does it mean? Aina. That which feeds us, brings us life. And then the last word, oya i'o. And oya i'o means truth. Genuine, real. Now the words, aloha aina, oya i'o, really was... The words that were pronounced really at the time of the so-called overthrow period into the attempted annexation period. And again, I use the word attempted as we'll talk about later. Now, was it contemporary for those days? Yes. Was it something they probably used a thousand years ago? I don't think so. But it was still based upon Traditional principles, and I'll come back to that today when we talk about the term kapu aloha later on. So aloha aino oye i'o are like strands to this ancient past of where we come from, but they're being applied really again to the issues of today based upon principles of the past. And where do these principles come from? And I like to talk about when you, when you think about what shapes a people, 
the most important element that shapes the thinking and philosophies and ideologies of our peoples, we look to things that we might think of as being creation stories, or we call cosmogenies, or cosmology, which is a scientific term. The word cosmogony, singular, cosmos, and the everything, the universe, or the multiverse, depends what you want to think about, and gonos. Yeah, so gonos kind of means like genealogy, a generation. So a cosmogony is like a genealogy of the cosmos. Now cosmogonies, plural, is the idea of multiple cosmogonies or stories. Now these are myths. These are um, tales, could be legends, could be religious doctrine, but the main purpose is to explain how does everything become. So in the Hawaiian cosmogony, probably the most famous we start off is Hemele Kumulipo. Now, Hemele Kumulipo is also a very ancient mele. It's a song, it's a poem, it's poetry, it's a prayer, it's a genealogy, it's a history. Uh, what else is in there? It's a whole bunch of stuff. Over 2,000 lines long. Takes about three hours to perform from beginning to end. And the, this Hemele Kumulipo, although ancient, we always refer to a particular version. And he's word version. Because when we think about the Kumulipo, it's not that you have the Kumulipo. You have Kumulipo, you have ver uh, versions of the Kumulipo. And we think about that was performed for Lono Ikamakahiki or Klani Nuyamamao in the early 1700s. And upon the birth of this child, the kahuna come forward to perform the kumulipo, but really the purpose, of course, is to explain what makes this child so important. And in doing so, they're going to recite this ancient song that doesn't just start with who his parents are, who his grandparents are, or the first canoes are, but in fact talks about who this child is by talking about the child is connected to even the very beginning of time. So I think it's an important thing to think about a philosophy as a people. When Hawaiians think about when did we begin as a people, when did we begin? When everything began. Not in 1776. Not in 1270. Not in the year 1 AD or 5000 BC. But the idea that when everything begins in the opening lines of the so-called Himeli Kumulipo. The word ao. One syllable word, two letters, ao. That's one of those words that has a lot of different meanings. Okeao. One meaning of ao. It's like time, the epoch of time. Yeah, the age of time, ao. Another meaning of ao, like space. Think of like space, outer space, ao. A third meaning of ao is like to flow, like how um, a current moves, ao. So think about that. Time, space, space, time. Where have we heard that those words being used together before in more recent history? Space time, time space. Who made that a popular phrase in the scientific world? Einstein. Einstein. I submit to you even before Einstein, our kupuna had a sense of space time and time space. But they had other, also the sense of flowing. Ao is also the word for what? I. But think about that. I, the cosmos, I, the universe. I am the, I mean, again, all those kinds of ideas. O keau. The word kahuli. Kahuli means like to turn, to churn. Time, space, the flow starts to turn. And that's the opening lines of the kumulipo. The second, okay, are we kahuli? 
Vela taho nua o ke au ika huli lo le kalani. O ke au, time, space, flow, turns. Vela. Everybody get together hands like this. Clap them together. Rub them real hard, as hard as you can. What happened? Vela. vela. What is that vela? And what is heat? What is it? Energy. What is energy? What is energy? What is energy? Oh, mass. Huh? Mass. Mass? Okay. Well, what you find is everything energy. Everything, in fact, is energy. Now, what do you think? Look at this. is the opening lines of the Kumulipo. Okiawi Kahuli Vela Kahonua. And they tell us we are the anti science people. Do never ever be fooled again. Never be fooled. That's bullshit, bull crap that's put upon our people by people who look down upon other human beings to think that they are the only ones that understand science. And I will submit to you from our opening lines of the Kumulipo, it is scientifically based. And I would submit pretty good in regards to the science. Okiao, Kahuli, Vela, Kahonua, which becomes mass. Okiao, Kahuli, Lole, Kalani. Time and space turn again also. And it says that the heavens will turn inside out. Kalani will turn inside out. But think about this philosophically. I want you guys to really think about this. If I turn this inside out, what does it mean? Don't be afraid. If I turn this inside out, okay, what does it mean? Perspective change. In other words, if this is the beginning, what's the problem with that? If I can turn something inside out, it had to have been what? Outside in first. The point I'm trying to say, even the Kumulipo suggests, even what we think as being the beginning, isn't really the beginning either. Because for, to me to turn this shirt inside out, it had to have been outside in. My point is that Kumulipo is one of these things philosophically tells, there's a lot of info that's in there that makes you kind of wonder and think about. That sense that even when we talk about the beginning, maybe it's not really the beginning. Maybe it is a redo. And what you find many of those involved in cosmologies and astrophysicists have some of the same kind of theories today also. I don't want to get stuck with the Kumulipo. That's a whole other lecture I can do. But the main point, as I want to say, is that a Kumulipo begins. And it starts when? With the beginning of everything. Causes the light to shine, the earth. And then it comes into the beginning of the first chapter. The first wa. Han nao ku ko ko han nao kana ka a ko ko puka han nao te toi unu te po nu han nao kana he toi puka han nao ka pe ka pe pe kana keki puka han nao ka ina ka ina han nao kana halu la puka han nao ka ha vai ko ana ku. And starts to talk about the first so-called life forms that we have on the planet. Han nao ka uku ko a ko a. The coral polyp is born. Where does life begin on this planet? In the ocean. Is that scientifically correct? You bet your call, ladies. You think Darwin taught us that? <laughs> and they tell us we should thank Darwin for teaching us about natural selection and evolution. What arrogance. What arrogance. 
we understood that life began from the ocean. And all the simple invertebrates come out during this period. And you think about life that, that comes from the ocean, the first life forms, of course, are things that form the reef. That's why we always believe the reef is the foundation of life. And think about what's going on on this planet right now. What is dying right now? And why are they dying? I tell you, some, some greedy, wicked scientists working along with big business. You see, science likes to portray that they only do good. We are in this predicament right now because of some bad science. The earth is dying right now because of some greedy, bad science. Let's tell the truth. Just because they do science, it don't mean it's all good. I can talk about, you know what talk? Rungle up, bikini, Micronesian brothers and sisters. I can talk about them dumping nuclear radio radioactive materials in the Pacific. That's science. We can talk about genetically modified foods, insecticides, pesticides, poisoning our lands and waters. That's science. But funny how they only talk about the good science. That's right. Science is neither good or bad. It's the scientists we got to worry about. All peoples have science. Science doesn't belong just to some people. We come from our people that are based upon science and scientific principles. But just because you say you do science, please don't tell me it's all good. I can tell you stories and stories and stories of how bad it can be used. And in the second wall, we have the fishies that come out, the swimmers. But one of the things that's important to the kumulip, I'm going to, you know, go quickly through this, hopefully. There's some very important refrains that are produced over and over in the kumulipo. Every time a new life form comes up, enters, not human. Again, this is poetry. What are they talking about? But one idea during this time period, it's a time period of the divine, of the God. Not of humans. Humans have yet to come up, up here. That's one interpretation. The other I learned also is that this is said over and over again because after, whenever you have a new creature, a new life form, what is in each life form? But a kua. In other words, all life forms are what? Divine. Everything has a piece of a kua as part of it. So you think about a kupuna, how did they see the world out there? That the world was filled with what? Divinity. Holiness. Whether something was a bug, or a tree, or a bird, it all had something special quality as being divine. Now let's, let me just agree real quick. Not, I'm not trying to make anybody hoo-hoo, but that's what I do sometimes. Let's go compare it to Genesis, just to show you the philosophies. And the story of Genesis, God speaks the world into being. Yeah, he works for six days, takes a holiday on the seventh. Yeah, creates Adam, creates Eve from Adam. But there's one important line. He empowers Adam in a particular way. And he says, man shall have what? Dominion. Say it again. Dominion. Say it loud. Dominion. Okay, dominion. I want you guys to look at that word, dominion. Now, what does the word dominion mean? Ownership. Ownership. Dominate. When something is your dominion, you're the bull, you're the king. 
Everything around in the Garden of Eden, everything that's created is for whose use? For them, for us, we the humans. Humans have what, again? Dominion over everything. Now, what do you think about that? Language, what does that mean? What is the philosophy that tells you? In that world, what is a tree? What is the land? Well, it becomes natural resources. But what does natural resources mean? What is a natural resource? Meaning what? I can take the tree, and then what? I can use them. I can modify. I can make timber. I can make mod. Everything is created for my dominance. I, I own it. So yeah, I can own the water. I can own the sun. I can own the air. I, can, I might even own another human being. See, I want you guys to understand, cosmogenies are very important. Because cosmogenies will lay out, basically, the plan of how you exist on this planet. How you relate to everything on this planet. And I would suggest, if you get a bad plan, you're going to end up with a bad planet. So part of the struggle, I want you guys to understand, when you talk about struggle, we talk about aloha aina o iyo. It's not just about whether or not Kahuku will get windmills or not. It's about a deeper way of thinking of what is the world around us for? Who does it benefit? Is it benefit for some? In fact, I'm just going into the Kahuku windmills right now. And I honor those guys. I really do. I know what it's like to struggle and use your families every night. I do. And I honor them. And I keep on saying, e even if they don't suppose it win, as you would think of it, they already won because they still stood up and said something about it. Because those in power, those in power, those who want to have dominion over them, over their lives, over their health, over their families, you think they give a shit about those people in Kahuku? No, they don't. I tell you right now, they don't. And I tell everybody else who may not even be living in Kahuku, you better be ready because you guys are next. So if you think that has nothing to do with you, yeah, maybe right now. But when they come upon your mountain, when they divert your water, when they start to pump pesticides and other crap into your land that affects your children, you remember. That those who believe that they have dominion over that land and your lives did it because we said nothing. And the only way, the only way we stop them from the continued abuse of our people is we got to educate ourselves first. And we got to remove any fear that we have to speak on behalf of our kids and our grandkids to come. And just by virtue of one person standing, that's the hardest one. Because two going to come, ten going to come, a hundred. And the question over the windmills, as I've said, it's just a question of organizing and educating. If you have a hundred people sitting on that road, they get real nervous, real, real nervous. You have a thousand people on that road, those turbines don't move. So the question is not what they do. Who's the question on? But we do. That's it. So I honor my brothers and sisters. And whether they're in Waimanalo, to define for themselves, as all peoples have a right to define for themselves what is best for the community. Who knows better than the community itself? But this is nothing new. Where those who benefit, look at the windmills. I don't see any windmills going above Hawaii Lower Ridge. But it's important to sustainability. <laughs> oh yeah, that important, go put them up there. How about Manoa? How about above Nuuana, go put some up there. They tell us it's that important. If it's that important, put them up there. 
See if your family is like living that way. Oh, they got to expand the dump. Where are they going to put it? Put away the Hawaiian stay out there again. Keep it in Hawaiian Icos. We can't have it. This is, this is backyard politics. Bet your ass it's backyard politics. If it's so good, put it in your backyard. But that's politics, you see. And the only way you beat that is by organizing the community. Period. Organizing the community. Because those in power, those who benefit off that pain, and those who profit, what you understand? Profit off that pain, they really don't give a damn. They'll find all kinds of excuses. Oh, this is for a sustainable future. Really? Who do you think is the number one user of power on these islands? The people in Kahuku? That's who needs that power? The military, number one. The hotel's number two. I remember this is kind of a long time ago, so you cannot quote me anymore about this. But I remember the Sheraton Waikiki at one time. Sheraton Waikiki. That one hotel used more power than the whole island of Molokai. And they were talking about building windmills in Molokai to send to this island. So my point you got to understand the capacity of power. I mean, even the rail. I mean, they got to figure out. I don't know how they're going to power the rail. But that's part of the question they got to figure out. But I tell you what, somebody make, making or has made a lot of money off of the damn rail. That's for sure. Where the hell was I now? Where did I stop? <laughs> now, towards the end of the first chapter. Okay, kane hua vai a kua ke na o kalina ka vai hu o uluai. Okay, kane hua male is being compared to the hua wai, the water gourd. Now, if you see my hands, the. Ah, that is God. He said, What is that? What do you mean, God? Why is the water god, gourd, I should say, not God, the water gourd being compared to a god? Well, again, again, this is symbolism. This is poetry. What is in a water gourd? Water. And what does water do? That's right. You know, one of the uncles taught me, if I took a seed, right, and I put the seed right here, or put it on the ground, what's going to happen? Nothing. But I put a little bit of water, what happens to that seed? Ah, kua kena, that is God. That's what they're saying in Hawaii. Now, what are they saying? Well, you look, it's like water. Something, you want to call it chemical react, whatever you want to describe it. That act of where a seed which was had latent life because of the water being added becomes alive. That's what God is. That's godliness. That power of life. Life. When you think about this, anyway, life is godly. Life is divine. So water has this kind of, as a, again, it's metaphor, but as this, as this example of life, that's life itself. And you think about all the scientists running around up in Mars or sending things, what are they looking for up in Mars? Water, how come? They may make had life up there. And we think about water in today's world. And I'm going to connect to Mauna Kea. The highest mountain in the Pacific. Lake Waiau. Not the highest lake. Ancient water source. Millions of years of water. The water table. Our kupuna tell us the water from that mountain drains into the whole island. Well, the TMT guys say, well, you know, we're not really sure exactly where the water is going, but we can approve in this, blah, blah, blah. But it's not going to affect the water table. Now, am I that foolish to hope that they correct? Now, me, I just look at, when I look at how they treat water out there, their culture, their philosophy, all I got to look across, look across the United States. 
They have rivers where they cannot even swim in. They have waterways. They cannot even drink the water. In fact, they poison their own water in places like Milwaukee or Detroit. People are living like that. And they're going to tell us? They're the experts about water? Are we that foolish? Why would we ever take any chances about water when our kupuna tell us what is water again? Water is life. If there's anything that is, again, when people, well, he's bound to kill us, of course. What is sacred but life? What is life but water? Is it any more simpler to explain why is Mauna Kea sacred? Does it provide life? That is sacred. What gives you life is, that's why our waterlands are what today call the watersheds. Traditionally, the Wawakua was not places anybody would go up there unless for specific purposes. Because anything you did up there affected who? Everybody else down. The kupuna I used to work in would talk about they would never go up in the uplands to go swim in the stream. Because everybody drank that water. So why were those places kept that way? Because they were seen as being, the idea of something being pristine and clean, as they say, cleanliness is next to godliness. Pretty simple to put two and two together. You'd keep those areas pristine. As a way to always respect. When I look at things like Mauna Kea again. These areas where you would rarely go up to. Only for specific and special occasions under protocol. Areas that we would call the Wawakua. Places of the gods. It also teaches us to remember that there is a hierarchy of land. And there are those special places that you hold that way. Even the holy world calls it conservation lands. But let me tell you about the holy world and the ideas of conservation lands. I don't even know why they call it conservation lands. When you look at the top of Mount Nakia, you already have 13 telescopes. And all 13 that are built up there Never given consent by our people. Always fought against by our people. Cannot be built. Probably right even in Honolulu, right here. Because of the kind of chemicals that they use. Because of the height. And yet they call them conservation lands. The TMT, at least 15 stories, as much as another three if you count in below, will be the highest building on the island of Hawaii. You couldn't even build that in Hilo Town. Five acres impact, it's like the state capital, on conservation land. So tell you something about when they use words like conservation. If the TMT can be built there, there is no place in Hawaii that is protected. And I don't know why some foreign corporations from Canada, China, India, Japan, Caltech, are so important to our people that they can be excused for impacting places that have been set aside. Not just by our laws, as Kanaka, but even their own laws. And to me, what the TMT really represents, again, is going back to the narrative of the dominion. Who gets to decide? Who has the power to decide? <clears throat> Much of this control over our minds, because again, I would say this, we are waking up. We are correcting the so-called miseducation that has occurred for far too long. 
Miseducation based upon principles of dominion. I'll give you a simple one. Christopher Columbus, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria sailed the ocean blue and taught us what? The earth was round. Bullshit. Even when Columbus sailed, they already knew the earth was round. And I'm talking about Europeans. Of course, we already knew. He discovered a new world. Discovered? Millions of people living in a place. He discovered a new world. See, that's the mythology that captures your brains. These ideas are poison. Because they make you believe somehow to justify not just their presence, but what they can do to our peoples. The United States talks about things like manifest destiny. What the hell is manifest destiny? The idea that it was God's plan for them to come to the so-called new world, provide genocidal policies and, and policies of extermination of the natives of America, to move across towards the West as part of God's plan? I don't know what God they're praying to. I get questions about that God. <coughs> Manifest destiny? They teach us about their so-called heroes like Thomas Jefferson, the great father of the United States, who was also a well-known what? Slave owner. He had a particular taste for young black girls also. He had children, one of his own slaves, Sally Hemings. That's Thomas Jefferson. And in fact, go and read the writings of Thomas Jefferson, what he said. In fact, it says more Native Americans were killed under Thomas Jefferson than any other president. That's Thomas Jefferson. And how about his language? Who said this? Exterminate them. Sounds like Hitler to me. In fact, he says, exterminate them to the Mississippi. I quote, that is Thomas Jefferson himself. And they teach us somehow that's our daddy, our country. That is poison. That same mentality rules Hawaii even to this day. So for me, the, the process of education is to reverse the first miseducation to break that mental incarceration that tells you, oh, you know Hawaiians, you guys know can work together. Have you seen the Republicans and Democrats in the United States lately? <laughs> and you're telling us, can I work together? Do you know what happened in 1897? And a petitions with virtually every Hawaiian united, led by the women who organized the petitions against annexation, submitted on the Senate floor in 1897, which did what? It stopped the put. They stopped it from happening. Correct. And I need to share this guy. Once I had this one, go, but Kalikwa, you know, the Kui petitions never work. Oh, boy. See what Mr. Education does? Of course it worked. That's why to this day, there is no what? There is no treaty of annexation. Now they can tell you that bullshit story over and over and over. And it's up to you from now on to believe that bullshit story. But if you choose to believe that bullshit story, that's who you are. The truth is there is no treaty of annexation. We have never given consent. They have no clear title to these lands. And so I say, no TMT. On top of Mauna Kea. Mauna Kea are lands that belong to who? Us, the Kanaka. I don't give a rip what Ige believes. He may believe the earth is flat. He may believe in the doctrine of discovery. He may love Thomas Jefferson. That's up to him. But I know this, it doesn't matter what he believes. I know what the facts are. And it is our responsibility to keep up with saying these facts. 
Because aloha aina oye iyo. Hear the last word. Oye iyo. Is to tell the truth. So we must fight against. Struggle against. Those mechanisms. Which try to erase from us. From our minds. To deculturation. Which attempted to kill our language. But we're still here. Misinformation and miseducation to teach us even Hawaiians that Captain Cook discovered us in 1778. Like we were rocks and trees just hanging out waiting to be discovered. <laughs> then you can go to a public education school, including the University of Hawaii, that will talk about an annexation that happened in 1898. so much for the education at the University of Hawaii, that we, and I use these four things that I talk about for the future, that we have to recognize, they recognize, they recognize. It is up to us. We got to study. We got to learn. We have to educate ourselves. We shall never allow the so-called oppressor and the settler and those who control our oppression to educate us. Because that education is about taming us. That education is making us soft. So we just suck in and follow their program. We have to control our own education. Second is to analyze. Means we got to start comparing. We got to look at read. We got to look at history. We got to start to study this. Provide some analysis. Look at power. To understand what is power. What is racism, for example? What is it? I just don't like the guy because he got green hair. No, that's not what racism is. As I teach my students, three Ps. Has to do with power. Has to do with some kind of prejudice, some kind of alibi. And the last has to do with privilege. Analyze. The third is we got to organize. Means we got to get together, stand together. We got to meet. We got to share. We got to plan. Now, just like last month, 20,000 Hawaiians running through the streets of Waikiki. Right on. That's good. And then what? See, organize means I'm going to take that energy and I'm going to put it into something. That's organize. That's the hardest part of the work. Easy for take flags and walking up and down the street. That's easy stuff. Organize is when you come with some kind of ideas that you're working together for the same plan. That's the hard stuff. That's the work. And last, we got to exercise. Means you're going to have to walk the walk. Take that stand. Speak the speak. Do whatever is necessary to demand. And I use the word demand strongly. Our humanity. Our right to exist in this place. Our right to tell the truth about this history. Our voice. Our right to continue to struggle against the TMT, for, that foreign corporation. And to speak out against it. To organize against it. If it means us guys making a stand up there where we are right now, so be it. If it means a hundred of us getting arrested, so be it. I'd rather have a thousand of us up there that day. Even five thousand would be even better. But at this point in history, it doesn't matter what they do. It matters what? What we do. That's it. It matters what we do. What we do in our classes. What we do in our student organizations. What we do in our families. What we do in our community meetings. Because if we don't do nothing or say anything, or don't fight back, they will erase us, without a doubt. But one of the things I always say to end with this note, with all the commodification, deculturation, missionization, military occupation, commercialization, whatever going on in Hawaii, all that, miseducation, Deculturation, we still heal. We still fight back. Because their goal is that we don't one day. 
Their hope is one day no one says anything. In fact, their plan is one day that we just smile and take it all in. But for me, and I hope for many of you, for the hope of our lands, this place, what makes this place special. For Lahui, the people of these lands, and more importantly for our Mo'opuna, our grandchildren and grandchildren to come, that this is just the beginning of a better Hawaii. And whose hands is this in? All of ours. Nolila, mahalo, and kalamai. I kind of went off a little bit off topic, but sometimes you go with the flow. With that, mahalo nui, aloha nui kaku.